to the Beyond 50 radio program. I'm Daniel Davis. Today we have the wonderful pleasure of bringing back a guest that we have earlier in the year that's going to be talking about something that you'll want to keep your ear to the phone or even the speaker when it comes to growing cannabis. He is somebody who's going to be an expert at telling you the optimal conditions to get the best kind of result that you're looking for. That's right, because he is president of Geo Growers LLC, which is a company which specializes in its high-performance quality soil blends that are science-based. The company that he founded became the go-to source and knowledge base for ecologically-based landscape, garden, and food production systems. He's also presented the latest research on the role of trace minerals within living systems and biologically-based agriculture. I'd like to welcome the Beyond 50 radio program today, our guest, George Altgelt. George, thank you for being back on the program today. Well, thank you very much. Yeah, it's a real pleasure to be here. Now, everybody's jazzed about CBD and cannabis, and everybody's just jumping on the train and trying to cash in, but a lot of times people go on there, they're probably doing real super re- official research when it comes to actually growing and trying to understand how to deal with all this. What would you say to what you've experienced out there? Well, um, you know, I've, I've been studying this since about 1994. And, you know, looking at the trend and knowing that this was coming, and all you had to do is look at California, and you would know that this was uh, an up-and-coming agricultural um, adventure. We'll call it that for the moment. Uh, and I had oriented um, um, much of what I have to say around the frequently asked questions, which is uh, FAQs. Um, and um, and there's, you know, I really just want to cover the fundamentals uh, because uh, so often just the fundamental, uh, um, you know, knowing knowing how to start. Uh, a lot of people are experienced at growing, and uh, and and even those people uh, probably would benefit from some of the research I've done in soil, soil minerals, and the absorption of soil minerals. So I'm not, I'm going to start with you know uh, the one question which is always asked is what is the what is the preferred pH of cannabis, and um, you know the well the, you know the most common answer is that plant can survive and do well in a pretty wide range of soil pH um, but the, <clears throat> the the first thing to understand about any plant growing in the soil is uh, its roots will change the environment of the soil mostly to suit its needs and the first way that uh, any plant does that um, is by uh, harboring or giving uh, shelter or space to its you know, most precious allies, the symbiotic relationships that it has with microbes. And in the case of trees, trees love to have um, a fungal contingent uh, around their roots because fungus is always going to be on the side of the plant that is sponsoring it. And we'll use that word sponsor just for fun because um, not just trees do this, but lots and lots of plants that need fungi um, need that um, fungal mat to go out into the, you know, to venture forth beyond the roots, ahead of the roots, and find where the minerals are. And fungus is really good at that. Now, where does the fungus get its energy from? In order to do that kind of detective work, well, it's coming from the roots. And all plants exude, to a greater or lesser degrees, sugars through the roots. And you know, when they're well established, they have abundant sugars, and that's what fuels the fungus to build its its um, its web or its uh, its fungal mat, this network of little tiny fibers that goes through and starts to, uh, first of all, sniff out and find, and then transport the minerals back into the plant's roots. Um, trees are heavily dependent on it because they have last year's leaves on the ground underneath them. And leaves are not easily digested by, by microbes per se. A fungus is much better at doing that because there's very little energy in a dead leaf. 
it mostly has to be digested by something that can break it down. Um, and microbes are always looking for protein. That's how they build their populations. Um, the fungus is looking for um, cellulose, uh, which is very good at breaking down, and then the minerals that it yields as it does break down. That's what um, plants will use the fungus contingent for. And um, microbes of every sort are sponsored by the plant that's growing in the soil. So to get back to that question, what's the preferred pH? Um, you can use just about any pH, but remember, if you're close to neutral, or if you're even slightly below neutral, the cannabis will prefer it. Because as a youngster, as a young emerging plant just out of the seed, the first thing it's going to want to do is take up trace minerals. Now, trace minerals are so very important for building frame, first and foremost. That plant has to build frame. It's got to be able to put its leaves up into a fairly uncluttered sky. And all of those materials are very much based on trace minerals. Now, in, a, in just a little bit, we'll talk about um, the polyphenolics, which are the major. Um, um, that's, that's what uh, CBD is. That's what THC is. Um, there are alkaloids also that are associated, and all of them are based and built on um, the uptake of trace minerals. But what makes them, makes, to your advantage, is to, is to have a 7 or below, is the plant can immediately start taking up trace minerals, and I'll give you the best example I can, and that is copper is the foundation for almost all of the polyphenols. And copper is a major component of building lignin. Lignin is the, the building block for fiber, for bark, um, everything that plant uses to interface with the outside environment is going to be lignin. And it's going to go um, to the plant's advantage to have plenty of materials to build that with. Now, the plant builds frame first, so that's where all of its trace minerals are going to go. If the pH is low enough, it'll be able to take up all the trace minerals, and the most sensitive of all is copper. Once the pH goes above 6.5, um, copper starts to drop out of the picture, if you're talking about the picture of mineral absorption. And the mineral absorption um, um, is critical on all of them, but copper's the first to go away when the soil becomes too alkaline. And then you've got, um, you know, you've got molybdenum, you've got boron, you've got the whole host of trace minerals that make everything happen for that plant. But as the pH climbs, more and more trace minerals are not being absorbed. That's why the plant's got to be able to change the pH around its roots. And the major way that plants do that is they exude carbon dioxide around their roots. And that's what lowers the pH, because the carbon dioxide mixes with the moisture in the soil, and it becomes carbonic acid. And carbonic acid, although it is a weak acid, it is enough to change the pH low enough to start absorbing trace minerals. So <clears throat> now that, that is one of the first fundamental questions that's, that's always asked about why is pH important? Why is it critical? That's, you know, that, that would be the second frequently asked question is, is why? You know, you know, what's the preferred pH? And then why is that preferred? And it's, it has everything to do with trace mineral absorption. So once that has been established, once the plant has begun to use what's in the soil to build frame, the next thing it's um, very, very concerned about, um, and you know, here we have uh, you know, a, a whole array of plants, and you can just see their concern. You, know, you have the parent plants with their glasses on, surveying the scene, and uh, actually they're doing, they're not looking, but they're testing everything that's in the soil, and they want to know uh, what's, what is there in the soil that's to their advantage. And if you have 
a soil that's giving the correct pH from the very beginning, the trace mineral absorption is there from the very beginning. And this is one of the critical things if you're going to be producing CBD oil or any of the other alkaloids, the other terpenes, uh, the polyphenols, all of those are secondary plant metabolites. And, you know, that's, as my friend Jerry Bernetti always used to say, that's the holy grail for plant metabolism, is to have the secondary plant metabolites. Secondary plant metabolites are totally responsible for how that plant defends itself. I'll give you a really good example. Um, when tobacco is grown, everyone knows that it makes nicotine, and that's why it's being grown. Now, nicotine is an alkaloid, and uh, nicotine is very, very toxic to almost all insects, except for the ones that are adapted to dealing with nicotine. And that would be like the tomato hornworm, there's a tobacco hornworm, there's, you know, tobacco hornworms are the bane of the tobacco farmer. And for many, many time, years um, of late, you know, in conventional agriculture, the that's the point, you know, you're trying to poison tobacco hornworms. Um, and uh, coming late to that picture of how to control um, the natural consumer insect, you know, and a tobacco hornworm, by the way, turns into a moth or butterfly, depending on your entomological persuasion. But um, the plant may or may not uh, be able to defend itself adequately from being over consumed by the tomato uh, or tobacco hornworm. And one of the interesting things to come out of the discovery of that need for nicotine is if the plant is injured or if other plants of other species are injured around it, the tobacco plant gets the signal and starts making a lot more nicotine. And the, you know, the, the insect, moth or butterfly, that wants to consume the tobacco leaf is all of a sudden inundated with way more nicotine than it's used to. And it'll actually kill those insects that have adapted themselves to eating tobacco uh, as a leaf. And the... Uh, you know, that's, there are so many things being discovered about plants right now that um, it's, it's um, pretty remarkable uh, that we're not using the natural defenses of plants. Um, conventional agriculture is obsessed with N, P, and K, and, you know, growing uh, monstrous numbers of bushels per acre without really considering what's the trace mineral content. Can that plant even defend itself? And so often the answer is no. It can't defend itself. And what, it's, what it comes through with um, or what has to be done to save the crop is you go in and rescue it with toxic chemicals. And um, in the case of cannabis, we are trying to avoid that. And uh, that's, that's going to lead us into an array of questions that are going to be pertinent to um, uh, what, what, you know, what are the secondary plant metabolites used for? And, and that's, now we're going to start to get into the more um, specific questions of how to grow it. And, you know, there are many listeners who've got lots of experience. And um, for a, a lot of you, this is going to be, you know, old information. Uh, but for a lot of you, sometimes, um, you know, there's little little gems in, in this information that will really pique your interest and help you understand what is actually going on. So, by the way, if you have any questions, please ask. No, you're actually doing just fine. <laughs> okay, okay. Well, the, the next frequently asked question is, what do I fertilize with? And that is... Boy, is that a big topic. We'll get to it in just a second. Hold on. Yeah, I was having a sip of this very popular caffeine drink. Ah. Coffee. <laughs> Mathematicians swear by it. Um, and it is, it is a delightful um, 
Uh, caffeine is an alkaloid, I'm pretty sure. Correct me if I'm wrong, but um, it is quite enjoyable. Okay, so now the topic is what kind of fertilizers. Um, and you know we get lots of um, you know, so-called fantastic results um, with uh, conventional fertilizers, the N, the P, and the K. Uh, that's nitrogen, phosphorus, and K stands for potassium. And when you've got a... Um, you know, uh, every God, every garden center there is is selling you N, P, and K. And if you're, you know, if you're tall enough to slap the cash down on top of the countertop, they'll sell it to you. No restrictions. <laughs> that was often said about being able to go into Mexico underage and buy alcohol. But here's the, here's the um, the interesting truth about N, P, and K. And I want to talk about nitrogen first, because when you have a water-soluble nitrogen, um, you know, that's a, that's a salt of nitrogen. Uh, and in small amounts, nitrogen is there in water-soluble form. And the, the interesting truth of that is no plant can refuse nitrogen in its ionically suspended water-soluble form. The plant will take it up, and it will grow accordingly, and it will grow fast. Now, I'll give you a little bit of background about what nitrogen can do. One of the nitrogens out there, it's water-soluble, is urea. And this has been observed by many people who raise cattle. When um, a cow urinates on the ground, she stands in one spot, and all of that urine hits one place on the ground, and what you see happening is uh, in just, two, you know, 24 hours, uh, and especially two or three days later, that grass just shoots up. It, it, that spot grows rapidly, and it'll grow anything that's there. Weeds, you know, grasses, uh, you know, you name it. Uh, and even the... You know, the preferred grasses that cows would like to graze on will just shoot up. But what's really interesting is no cow will eat that grass. And it's not coated with urine. This is all new grass. But the reason they don't eat it is because it's void of trace minerals. It grew much faster than the trace minerals could be taken up. And the cow knows instinctively, probably for an, uh, an array of sensory stimuli, that that's not going to be good for the cow to eat. And she'll go on to a, another spot where the grass has not been grown like that. Animals know this kind of thing very quickly. And as my friend Jerry Bernetti used to say, um, they've got PhDs in what to eat and what not to eat. And, you know, we the farmers could learn a lot from them just by watching their preferences. But one of the reasons why nitrogen is not a good fertilizer to use in its water-soluble form is because it will grow the plant much faster than it can take up trace minerals. And you as a grower are going to have a lot of crop that's going to be lower in polyphenols and other secondary plant metabolites. So the plant is going to wind up in a position of not being able to defend itself because it couldn't take up enough trace minerals to make the polyphenols and the other secondary plant metabolites that it uses to defend itself. You may have to intervene with something like, you know, something toxic. And uh, for CBD, the pressure is now on to produce it organically. And I can tell you I've um, met and talked with a gentleman who actually separated the CBD oil from everything else in that plant. And he's got, you know, a whole vat full of everything that was um, squeezed out of the cannabis and, and extracted. And he says, most of my effort goes into separating the CBD from the toxic chemical load that was in the soil before that plant was ever grown there. He says, it's a nightmare. He says, I can't, I can hardly do it all because there's so much there that's not CBD that's got to be removed. 
He says the best thing is to grow it in soil that's never had herbicides, never had any kind of poison put on it. So there's a big push um, to produce these things organically. And that's, that is certainly where things went in California because there's, um, um, you growers can correct me if I'm wrong, but there's um, um, uh, a requirement that uh, in California um, these products be grown organically. Uh, hold on one second. As we're uh, listening to the best way to grow CBD and cannabis, our guest today joining us, George Outgelt, founder and president of Geo Growers. Boy, we're learning some real pearls here, that's for sure. Oh, thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Yeah, and just um, in, in case you need to contact us, I'll give you our phone number first. It's 512-892-2722. And then anyone that picks up the phone can give you an accurate uh, uh, email address. But for the most part, it is admin at geogrowers.net. And you can reach us with an email. Um, yeah, there's, and, and, you know, we, we love to get any kind of communication. Um, and I'll, I'll just stop at this point. <coughs> And say um, one of the um, um, one of the things that I've worked on since you know studying this whole thing since 1994 is um, I started working on an organic growing medium, which uh, it, it's interesting. It's uh, yeah, it costs more, but boy, is it clean. Uh, my potting soil called Thunderhead Soil is about as organic as it can get, but if you want it certified organic, and we did, that is going to be Thunderhead Prime. And <clears throat> I'll tell you a little bit more about uh, Thunderhead Prime as soon as we finish with the N, P, and K discussion, which uh, is formidable. And again, I'm going to say I'm just touching on the fundamentals. Right. Uh, you know, and it's quite but, amazing, too, when you think about it, George, that it's the fundamentals that people lack in, and they're the things that you need to be the best at the most. I mean, for instance, you know, common sense when you watch sports. You know, it's the fundamentals that that people lose games in. <laughs> you're right. Mm -hmm. You're right. You know, when you're, when you're working on the, you know, for instance, like a basketball sport I enjoy, the fundamentals – had most teams made 100% of their free throws, this is a free throw, nobody can test this thing, then you're probably going to win the game. <laughs> <It's crazy. laughs> right. <laughs> but anyway. Right, yeah, that's why they practice that so much. Yeah. Well, <clears throat> that <clears throat> what I just outlined about nitrogen, you know, plant can't refuse it. And it basically forces the plant to grow. And then the next thing you know, you've got a plant devoid of trace minerals, and it starts to um, fall behind, or I call it flagging or lagging behind, because it, it's, um, you know, it's not strong. It, it's, um, you know, it's big, it's showy, it's uh, lots of biomass, but it's not producing everything it needs to defend itself with and certainly not producing uh, the CBD um, um, very complex molecules. These are all secondary plant metabolites. And this is what you're after. You want for that plant to be as high in CBD as it can possibly get. And um, the forced growth it comes from, a high nitrogen fertilizer, uh, is not going to give you that. It would be um, not only better, but cheaper not to force that growth. And, you know, you've got a whole business model that you're trying to conform to. But um, the, the reality is um, the, the, the content of CBD is going to be very dependent on uh, trace minerals, that slow paced growth for that plant. Now, you know, there can be all kinds of reasons why you have to have, um, you know, a massive amount of growth, and there's some business models where that works. But if you're really in it for, you know, the, the, um, the polyphenol content, and in Europe, uh, when it comes to olives, 
uh, they've got whole labs scattered all across the country that measure polyphenol content, whether it's grapes or olives or any other crop. And we also have labs here in the United States that measure polyphenol content. That's uh, rapidly coming to the forefront because of the CBD oil industry. And, um, you know, as, as my acquaintance talking about extracting CBD, uh, you don't want to have to spend a lot of effort trying to get it free of the herbicide residues that were in that soil before you plant it. These are all considerations for uh, w what's viable, what's economical. Um, that's you know that's going to be the main uh, consideration uh, anytime you're growing a crop. This is uh, it has the potential for being very profitable. And it also has the potential for being very costly. And as with any farming project, you have to look at, at cost. Uh, when I was a kid growing up, oh, man, you know, it was like the early 50s. Conventional farming had not really taken over. It didn't take over until after World War II when it was discovered from World War I that you could use nitrates to grow plants really fast. That was a discovery made by the Germans during the World War I uh, conflict. Uh, if they put um, nitrate fertilizer on their soil, uh, you wound up with you know, a bumper crop, which was totally unexpected. But once they got, that got caught on, everybody used it. And nobody had the capacity then to look at, well, is that good? You know, and with the trace mineral content dropping away um, and no one knowing it, uh, who could say? But the uh, upshot of using the nitrate fertilizer is you start to burn the microbes and you start to use up the carbon that's in the soil, which has a very, uh, again, fundamental place in soil ecology. You've got to have enough carbon in that soil so that the microbial populations and the fungal populations have shelter without carbon and all the various forms of carbon that are in soil uh, you're losing your your habitat you're losing your your soil biome is just going by the wayside because there's not enough carbon sequestered within the soil to sustain those populations and the, the diversity begins to drop this is another reason why you want to have a carbon rich soil it needs to you know be clean carbon it can't be you know corn stalks from uh, you know <laughs> from the last crop that was there that'll hardly decompose because there's hardly any microbes left in the soil you got to have pretty much virgin material virgin soil in terms of unaffected by herbicides um, so then let's get around to the P of the N the P and the K um, it all depends on where you are, and I'm going to strongly recommend uh, that you use a laboratory. Uh, and I use Texas Plant and Soil Lab quite a lot. Um, also, right out there in front is Logan Labs. And they'll give you all kinds of tests. You really need to know what questions to ask so that you can get answers that you can understand. Uh, but phosphorus is another one that's, uh, you know, superphosphate gets used all the time. And the interesting thing about superphosphorus, and it is a major plant nutrient, phosphorus is also critical in the building frame. Um, if you use a chemical or water-soluble form of phosphorus, what's going to happen is you're going to kill the fungal microbes that normally would extract phosphorus from the soil. Once you use it, you're going to have to keep on using it. And it can take anywhere from four to six to ten years for the fungal mat to come back to give you a natural extraction of phosphorus that may be easily in the soil in abundance. But the fungus is not there to extract it for the sake of the plant. That's um, the analogy quite often used about phosphorus. Once you use superphosphorus, superphosphate, it's like somebody goes into a beauty parlor with a blowtorch and scorches everybody's hair off. Well, that's going to take a while for them to all grow their hair back. And it's, uh, you know, that's certainly a high crime, but when it goes on in the soil, no one hardly ever thinks about it. But those fungal mats are gone, and it's, they've been blowtorched by that 
high number of phosphorus of the superphosphate. And they're not going to come back easily. Now, you can inoculate and get them to come back. Um, but you've got to stop using superphosphate. And the reason I'm recommending that you not use it at all, ever, is because a lot of soils are loaded with phosphorus, and they'll yield their phosphorus without you having to spend a dime on that particular major plant nutrient. And if phosphorus is not there, there are wonderful rock phosphates. There are three different ones. Um, the best known is the one from High Plains, Florida. It's a rock phosphate that you only need small amounts of it, and it yields its phosphorus for quite some time. But how much is there? You always want to use a lab. And I, I don't recommend, you know, the home soil test kit because there's too many variables. And if you want something you can hang your hat on at the end of the day, use a reputable lab. And I'm going to recommend Texas Plant and Soil Lab in Edinburgh, Texas. And then Google this one because I can't tell you where they are. It's Logan Labs. I've been using Logan Labs uh, for cross-reference to see what I'm getting. These, both of these labs also do plant sap analysis. And your plant sap analysis can be very valuable because you can see what's in that plant while the crop is developing. You don't have to wait till harvest time. You can know ahead of time. And you can adjust what you're doing with the soil. And now we're talking about um, irrigation, irrigation formulas. What are you putting into the irrigation water? A lot of this can be injected here in Austin, Texas. People who are irrigating are using either hydrochloric acid or sulfuric acid. Sulfuric acid is preferred because plants do like sulfur. And they're, they're very, very carefully adjusting the pH. Here's a big caution about adjusting pH. If you're in a growing situation and you think or you know that your soil pH is incorrect, Remember, if you move the pH one whole point, let's say from 7 to 6, the, the, um, the percent hydrogen, uh, which is what pH stands for, is, it's 100 times um, different from one point to the next point. If you go from 7 to 8, you're 100 times more alkaline at 8 than you were at 7. And to move the pH, one whole point will kill your plants. You have to make sure that you move the pH slowly or that you start with the pH that's correct and then maintain it or adjust it with irrigation water. And a lot of you who are irrigating already know this, but these are the fundamentals that new growers may not know. And, you know, I wanted to touch on that. And then the other one is um, the K, a major plant nutrient. Um, uh, potassium is used for root development. It's also the immune system of the plant. You've got to have enough potassium. Uh, Water-soluble forms of that force their way in. Many soils have uh, adequate to more than adequate amounts of potassium. And I don't recommend that you add anything in the way of potassium uh, unless you know you need it. And again, the microbial life is what makes that available to the plant. And the, the <clears throat> preferred pH uh, is being adjusted by the plant first and foremost. Uh, you don't really have to do a lot to assure that um, if you know that everything is correct. And, there's a plant sap analysis that you can get while the plant's ongoing, and it'll tell you, am I getting enough potassium into that plant? And small adjustments with water-soluble N, P, and K can be made without deterring the microbial habitat or the soil biota, but they have to be very small. You want to avoid burning anything. And uh, the most dangerous, of course, is phosphorus. You don't want to kill the the micro or the fungal mat that's providing the phosphorus. So if you need phosphorus, use a rock phosphate because that's not going to hurt anything. High Plains, Florida, the outfit's called Longcala. And Longcala's got um, distribution centers all over the United States, and I recommend them for, um, for a lot of good reasons.
and it doesn't take much. And you may already have an adequate supply of phosphorus in your soil. So get it tested before you start. And excuse me, that's that's one of the ones that you want to um, um, you know keep an eye on because if you don't, most grasses, you know, anything that's producing biomass has to have enough phosphorus in the soil to actually produce it. Um, you know, grass farmers, anybody raising cattle and they've got grass and they're concerned with pasture grass, they're always looking at phosphorus. And that's why N, P, and K, you know, goes on and on. But now the next one in our fundamentals of fertilizer has to do with calcium. And here's where I'm going to reveal one of the giants whose shoulders I stand on, and that's William Albrecht. Um, in, in, in discussions of organic production, um, this um, this man did more to study uh, soil than just about anybody I know of in, in actually determining um, the... Um, uh, what makes fertile soil fertile, and, and that's for the sake of crops. Um, crops um, are generally very different from weeds um, in that the the you know across the board crops generally have to have a certain amount of nutrients, and quite often it's called uh, the nutrient profile. And that's where the discussion of calcium needs to come in, because calcium is very, very critical for how well that plant produces and what it can actually absorb from its own sap stream. N, P, and K, it gets all the press. But the reality is that calcium is the chief of minerals. Calcium is the factor that enables a plant to absorb what's in its own sap stream. In human blood, we depend on the sodium-potassium ion pump. The potassium is inside our cells, the sodium is inside our bloodstream, and the two together as ions keep the soil cleaned out, sorry, not the soil, the cell cleaned out, and the nutrients flowing from the blood back into the cell. That's absolutely critical. Calcium has that role in a plant system. Plant tissues are all very, very dependent on available calcium. And available calcium is a whole other discussion, but here's what I want you to know about calcium. Cell walls are basically structures, and they're very important, just as any cell membrane is, but for it to be permeable so it can absorb nutrients and release what it's producing, that depends on calcium, and calcium has to be in its ionic form, and it has to be there in abundance so that the plant is not short on calcium. Calcium is what gives it its vigor. Plant cells that can't absorb or excrete are in real trouble, and that happens when calcium is deficient. Uh, that's, you know, that's one of the things that you've got to really watch. What kind of calcium is in the soil? You know, um, in the northern sections of the United States, uh, liming the soil became very popular. And uh, it was like, well, the, the soil's too acid up here, and we've got to do something to bring it down. So they would bring in limestone. And, you know, ground-up limestone, dolomite lime was very popular, still is in many places. But what they didn't realize was the acidic soil was changing calcium carbonate into calcium sulfate. And the calcium sulfate is ionically bonded with sulfur. The calcium is with sulfur. And as such, it becomes water-soluble and is easily taken up by the plants. And calcium doesn't force a plant to grow. Uh, it's very, very necessary. And the, those uh, extremely acidic soils were very much helped by calcium carbonate because it brings the pH up towards the neutral zone. But in the south... You know, and especially here in Texas, and Austin, Texas in particular, we have nothing but calcium carbonate. Uh, it's covalently bonded, and it's hard to break that bond. Uh, most of your trees around here, you know, the cedar elms, the live oaks, all these trees know how to do that. 
and they all do it by exuding carbon dioxide away from their roots, mixes with the moisture, becomes carbonic acid, and it's a strong enough acid to break that bond. But it's greatly helped when there's sulfur available. So in alkaline soils, uh, you really want to avoid using powdered limestone because you're already um, in an alkaline condition, and limestone is extremely alkaline. So what will help you in, um, in an alkaline soil is to add sulfur. Uh, it breaks the carbon, carbonate away from the calcium, and the plants can now absorb it, and all plants like and want sulfur. It's possible to overdo sulfur, certainly. You can overdo any nutrient. Um, but in the case of sulfur, um, you'd have to spend a lot of money to overdo sulfur. But here's what happens. Once there's too much sulfur, there are microbes that digest sulfur. They live on the energy of it, and they are not good for your crop. All of a sudden, you've got a sulfur digesting microbe population that's just taken over because you used too much sulfur. Now, that's rare that that happens, but there are cases where it does, and you want to avoid that. Again, soil analysis from a lab is going to tell you what you need to know. You'll get recommendations. Go ahead. Yeah, I was just going to say, boy, that's just such a lot to take in, and I wonder, you know, if anybody out there is actually taking all the notes. <laughs> and well, so, you know, what I was going to do is suggest that perhaps we can also direct them to a website where they can find out more information about all this because, I mean, I'm sitting here thinking, wow, there's a lot to this, but also I'm sure it's not that hard to, you know, put all this in motion once you get started. Yes. Well, I'm going to recommend a book. And it's by Charles Walters, the founder of Acres USA. And this book is called Grass, The Forgiveness of Nature. And in it, he says what all these nutrients are for and what they do. And the, <clears throat> that's a great book to start with. Because in many ways, cannabis is a grass. And it depends on what you're after. What are you trying to get from it? You know, Watching nutrient levels could be very, very important. If you're growing cannabis for fiber, not so important. You're going to get the fiber you want. Right. You know, mm -hmm. But if you're, if you're trying to produce a consumable uh, that is going to be you know, doing what CBD oil does, which is truly amazing, and that's, you know, I'm sure you've got people, people who can come in and talk about that. Um, <clears throat> those are... Those are the you know secondary plant metabolites that are going to require uh, um, lots of trace minerals and um, and trace mineral uptake, and so that leads me to the you know the probably the most important frequently asked question here in the last ten minutes of our interview, and that is um, what is the role of uh, cations and anions, and those are the, that's how a plant absorbs the trace minerals we've been talking about, and boron is one of them, I want to say this about boron, you always want to know what your boron is in your, in your soil, boron is responsible for the plant sap pressure, with, with uh, too little boron, there's not enough plant sap pressure for that plant to grow. You know, regardless of uptake of trace minerals, if you don't have any boron to speak of, if you fall below a certain parts per million, you're going to be in trouble because you're going to lose your plants, your plants vigor. It wants to grow vigorously, but if there's not enough boron, it can't do that. Conversely, if there's too much boron, there's too much plant sap pressure. And there have been instances where accidental overuse of boron has caused the vascular system of trees to just explode. Like, for instance, a swimming pool that got over, you know, they were draining a swimming pool that was controlling its algae with boron. It's a great way to control algae. You can kill algae with boron because the same thing happens inside a single-celled algal plant. You blow its vascular system to bits with too much boron. Well, the pipe broke <clears throat> on the way to the sewer system, and it flooded the yard with swimming pool water loaded with boron. Well, it killed the grass. It killed the whole yard. 
and the instances where whole trees have been killed because of too much boron. This is something to be avoided. Your, your boron needs to be in a range, not too little, not too much. And that's when, uh, what your, your uh, lab test is going to show you. And home kits don't really have the capacity to give you that. If they do, you want to question their accuracy. That's one of the things you do not want to get wrong is the boron. Uh, and, of course, it's connected to molybdenum, and molybdenum has everything to do with how much carbohydrate or sugars can circulate in that plant's vascular system. This is all very complex, but it's easily explained in grass, the forgiveness of nature. Um, go to the Acres website. You can buy that book. It'll tell you tons of stuff that I'm not even covering here. Mm -hmm. But to get back to that last frequently asked question, um, what, is, what are the anions and cations? What's their role? Um, they, that is how anions and cations, and they're equally important, um, they are lodged in the soil up against particles that either attract them or, um, or repel them. And this is one of the reasons why you don't want to overuse phosphorus. Remember that discussion about N, P, and K. P is the middle letter. It stands for phosphorus. And I've seen hundreds of soil analysis in lawns. Lawns not growing. Um, maintenance people will come to me and say, look, we've got this problem on. So I go out there, I take a soil sample, send it in, and the lab says, hey, you've got phosphorus that's right through the roof. It's sky high. Well, phosphorus has this very interesting effect on anions and cations. It will lock up trace minerals, and they can't be released to the plant because the phosphorus is just too high. You've got to bring the phosphorus down. Now, if you have that, one of the best ways to do it, and here's a nifty little trick, grow sunflowers on it. Sunflowers will accumulate the phosphorus in the stalks. Cut the stalks. Take them away. Don't let that composted stalk material wind up back in the soil. That's how you can bring the phosphorus back down. And I learned that just accidentally um, because I had, had that come up. And that's how we brought the phosphorus down. But what you're really looking for in the cation-anion exchange is the total exchange capacity. And you want for that total exchange capacity to be somewhere above 4. 4 to 7 is actually pretty good, 7 being really good. Um, and what it means is... Um, when the TEC, or total exchange capacity, is relatively high, uh, it means that the rain or the irrigation water is not going to leach away your trace minerals. It's being held in a, such a way that the plant can get to it, but it's not going to be washed away when there's a heavy rain. And one of the things you're aiming for is a high number in total exchange capacity. And you want your soil analyzed by a lab that can give you that number. Um, and, you want to be, <laughs> and you want to be able to discuss this with whoever your provider is. And most of these places will charge you by the uh, half hour, you know, by the whole hour, anytime you want um, any kind of discussion. But I can tell you that the, in the case of Texas Plant and Soil Lab in Edinburgh, Texas, if it's just a brief question, under 15 minutes, they don't charge. But if you've got some real problems and you want to ask these questions, they charge by the half hour, and it is well worth it. Um, I have gained so much knowledge over the years simply by asking questions. And the people that own it now, um, the Noel um, has got... Uh, such a grasp of knowledge, you know, you can ask him anything, and he'll he'll tell you uh, as best he can and explain it to you. Uh, but if you really want to get into it, get the book, so, uh, uh, Grasp the Forgiveness of Nature, and then there's another one by Andre Voisin. It's called Soil, Grass, and Cancer. That is one of the most enlightening books I've ever read, and it will tell you tons about soil. 
Um, you know, I'm glad you brought that up, and I wish we, you know, maybe for our next discussion we can talk about that when you say soil, grass, and cancer, because we cover this, you know, quite a bit in a very holistic way, and it kind of gets more and more surprising as they keep punching and pushing and, and talking about cancer. It's become to a point where, you know, I remember back in the 70s when I was, you know, a young boy and my mother was bringing up uh, there was a story called Sunshine, which was actually made into a movie, uh, maybe even partly inspired or inspired John Denver to make the song by the same name. You know, it was kind of one of those things on the on the fringe, you know, crank cancer, what's this? You know, it just seemed like this rare thing out there that, I mean, was rare. And nowadays it's almost as common as the cold. And they would make us all believe, you know, and I know this is maybe slightly off topic, but I think it's right on when we talk about what we're talking about here, is that they make you feel like it's, as I said, as common as the cold. And, well, you know, we're trying our best, but we just haven't figured out a way to cure it. Well, look who's actually saying that. It's the people that want to keep the industry alive, you know, so they can get all those exactly. donations. So when you talk about uh, cancer and, what was it, grass, you said, and the soil, uh, that would be a, a really wonderful discussion we have to get back to the holistic basics of all this because there's actually a documentary quickly on Netflix that talks about cancer that said, you know, look, we're all basically born with the cells, and now just applying, you know, a little bit of reason, okay, so cancer cells cause degeneration. Okay, well, that's basically what happens when the body needs to decompose after death. I'm guessing. I'm not a scientist. But when you take a look at it, they say, you know, it's actually a relatively easy cell to keep it in check. <laughs> and then they it's show true. you why. Like moving, you know, for instance, which most people aren't doing a whole lot of anymore. And, and so you see, well, maybe this is the reason, you know, what I would like to do is kind of put, well, why is this on the rise? Not to look at it from, you know, a super scientific perspective, but from your perspective and get people to think, you know, I never really thought about it that way before. So, Yes, we do wanted to talk about that because your body has built-in mechanisms to eliminate cancer. Right. And if you know how mm-hmm. to enhance that, you will never see cancer in your lifetime or your right. children or your right. loved ones. Right, yeah, exactly. And that would be a whole different discussion. I'd like to actually plan that because it's always a pleasure to have you on the program and talk about these things because it's wonderful to realize that you put a lot of reason back into what has become so unreasonable. <laughs> sure. And, and what I'd like you to do, George, quickly for our listeners is go out and uh, go ahead and give out your website where they can find out more information about all this because I'm sure that you know, our listeners are excited about the, the kind of things that you've been presenting here today. So. Sure. It's, um, just Google GeoGrowers and it'll come up as geogrowers.net. Um, and the the website is in a flux right now. We've had to take it over from someone who basically hijacked it from us. Uh, and you're, you will see new changes coming up on that website. Um, but, you know, some of the best discussion can be had just through conversations on the phone and then certainly um, emails. We try, attempt to answer every question that comes in through emails. And I do sell the Thunderhead Prime, and the advantage of it is you, uh, once you own it, you can just add the nutrients that you're taking out. Um, and it, it, it's inoculants, stay alive, everything's continues to work, but once you've made the initial purchase, we work with you to, to get that, um, just to put back what you're taking out, and we do it organically. Well, that sounds great. Again, George, thank you so much for being on the program today, and I look forward to the next time we talk. It's been a real pleasure. Thank you for having me on. You bet. Thank you again, George. We want to thank you, the listeners out there, for joining us. You can discover more at beyond50radio.com. That is the number 50. We do encourage you to sign up for our weekly e-newsletter. Keep up to date with what's going on in the world of Beyond 50 as well as our upcoming shows. I'm Daniel Davis. Again, thank you for joining us. This is the Beyond 50 Radio program. And remember, live your day past halfway. 